Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm your co-host with Debbie from the office here at Endless Prop Australia. And you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing endless world. Debbie, welcome. Good morning, Min. Today's topic of our podcast is what? Timing challenges in building SDA. Okay. So I was listening to your podcast or interview with Stephen, Steve from Hilltop Caring, our last episode, and um, I was listening to him talk about the challenges out there in the marketplace when it comes to housing and, and participants, and uh, it got me thinking, the key word here is timing. Timing is uh, timing from, from investors getting their finance order and knowing what to do, timing get, in getting the settlement of the land because it's your council, timing of engaging a provider as a provider who then goes out to source and network with SIL providers and support coordinators, timing of construction of the house, right? And timing of participants getting ready to move. There's a lot of a lot of balls being juggled in the air, Debbie. So let's talk about these these topics, please. Yeah, okay. No, it's a really good topic to discuss. I don't think people realise just how many different aspects go into this and, and trying to synchronise, I guess is a good word to use. All of those different timelines is is not impossible, I'd say. And so how do we do it? <laughs> well, but moving on from this topic, the consequence of this misalignment of timing uh, is causing is, has repercussions on investors being able to fill up their their, their stay homes out there. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So so let's go forwards a little bit before we go backwards. Out there, what is the current status out there of SDA houses? in terms of their success or failure uh, in, uh, with, with um, vacancy and occupancy at the moment? Well, I guess what's really coming out in the market at the moment is is oversupply of a lot of SDA in certain areas. A great example of this would be Townsville in Queensland, where there was a, a big demand slated uh, going back maybe four or five years ago, and everybody decided to build up there not knowing who else was building up there. That's the first problem. Second problem was there were then a whole lot of delays in construction with cyclones and natural disasters and lack of builders. And of course, you had COVID through all of this. So properties that should have taken a year to 18 months at the most to come to completion have have taken two to, in some cases, three years. So all these delays have meant that there wasn't really a, a clear understanding of how much Development was going on up in Townsville, and we're now faced with a pretty significant oversupply because just because of the timing was all wrong for everything. And that's one example there. Yeah. But what we're seeing more of, Debbie, around the country is uh, more vacancy or, or, or partial tenancy, and for all the, for all those reasons we mentioned earlier with those challenges. Yeah, and that's just the first challenge: the delays of construction, delays of getting the properties developed. And and this ties in, I think, quite significantly with the data. So we know that the data that comes out from the NDIS, and it's really the, the best kind of source of information we've got. We know it's not 100% accurate. We know that there are inaccuracies, inaccuracies in it. It is, when it first comes out, it is already six weeks out of date. Six months. Six weeks this week. out of date. And so we're working on old I want to say it's at least six weeks. Yeah. Well, it's it's as so for the latest one that came out was as of the 30th, 31st of March, but we got it mid-May. But Debbie, I want to say, that's not to say the data was as of. Yeah. I, I'll dare say it's probably a month. When did they start pro- actually collating that information? That. So really? We're talking about three, three-ish? Maybe. Months. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got very outdated data to start with. And that's really all we've got to go on, all anybody has to go on when they're looking at 
where demand is. We know the pipeline data is is not particularly accurate. I've spoken to builders who said, well, we have had properties in the planning and they're under construction and they've been under construction for three, four, five months and the la- latest data has just come out and they're not even included in it. This is obviously in a very small area where they know how many properties they've had and the, and the total numbers were like one or two instead of the, the 15 that they might have had added into it. So we know that there's problems there. So that's another aspect to, to the lack of ability to synchronize what we're doing here. Totally agree. And then also when you add the 10 to 12 months construction lag there, Debbie, uh, that 10 to, tw- oh, sorry, I call it 10 to 12, 10 months-ish, plus the two-month onboarding to the portal of the um, Proda account with our NDIS, SDA. Sorry, what am I saying? What am I saying? I am at the Proda onboard the enrollment of the home after completion into Proda to get it approved by the NDIS for the SDA compliance. Um, that's probably one to two months there, plus the 10 to 12 months construction. Yeah. Right? And then plus the procurement of participants. There's another six months. Yeah. So let's talk more about that. So before you, before okay. you go on, that's 10, 2, 6, and the original three-month-old data. So that we're now talking 20 months. Yeah, 18, 20 months. 20 months of delay of correct data. Mm-hmm. So by the time you have your house built and ready for in, intake of participants, that data is 20 months old, that, that you originally went in with with the mindset of, I'm going to get my house built and I have my two participants and, and this kind of money, it's 20 months old data, mm. right? And a lot of things change in 20 months. So much changes in 20 months in this industry. Um, we, we have seen the changes coming through week by week, month by month. But yeah, I think let's talk about the participant process. You know, everyone comes and says, I want guaranteed participants in, in a property if I'm going to buy it. Well, we... We know that's not a possibility. Best case scenario, which is is hard to navigate, is that you can work with providers, find specific participants who need a specific property and build it for them. Again, there's still no guarantee that by the time your property is ready, 18, 20 months or even longer down the track, the something else hasn't come along that suits that participant and they've already moved because they're desperate for a house. So, you know, there it is so hard to find something that is truly participant-led. And let's talk more about the participant themselves and what they're going through. Ideally, when a house does go to construction, that's when you need to start looking because a lot of the time participants don't have the funding in their plans. Why they're not already applied for it? Because there's no houses. So their support teams, their allied health workers, their support coordinators, their OTs, etc., have to go through a, a huge amount of work to put together their application to the NDIS to get this funding. And it can be weeks of work and reams of paperwork to get all these reports together, right? And they're not going to bother going through all of that effort if there's no SDAs to be moved into anyway. So that's why they often don't start the process until they know that there is a home on the horizon. This process at Best would take six months for a a participant to get all that paperwork together and have it submitted for approval. And then 12 months for approval. Well, it it can be done in six months, but it's more likely close to 12 months. Yes. So six months to prepare everything, lodging it, and then getting it approved in nine to 12 months Yeah. track. So best case scenario with a team that really knows what they're doing, they get that paperwork together really quickly, submit it as approved in six months but it's more likely 12 and they often are not approved for the funding level that they've requested. So then starts the whole review process. This all hinges on the on the fact that the, the writer, the report writer, OTs and whatnot are good at yeah. what they do. So I think that is so important that people don't understand. They've got to get the right team to help them with their application. And then the correct OT is dependent upon the participants having money yeah. to pay for it. The, the costs incurred for that six months of preparation of doctor's reports, psychologists, OTs, physiotherapists, whoever they may be, that all costs money and it must come from the family's fund. Well, there is no, no it comes funding. from the there plan. Is. There, is, there is funding yeah. in the plan for this process, but the participant may have run out of that, that 
segment of funding in their plan. They might not have enough to do this. Yeah. They've got to wait for the next plan review. So, you know, that's another complication. So you might look at the data and say, well, there's all of these participants and the NDIS has stated that that's going to grow by X percentage over the next three years, eight years, whatever. But it still all hinges down to the participants actually getting the funding in their plan. So that is a, a big issue that really um, there's there's no ready, easy answer to at the moment because it, it's such an individual thing for each individual participant and their support team to get that aspect right. So these delays, delays of, um, of approval for funding, delays of construction, delays of delivery of the product to the market, there be also delays of registration of land titles as well. Yeah. Look, we, we get builders coming to us with stock all the time. We always do our due diligence on whether it's good, but... It, 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 it even with three, four months to title, we'll add another two yeah, months delay. A lot of what is coming to us is in new estates just because there there is literally nothing else available. And these estates are still under development. We've got, I think, properties that have come through to us recently and they're not being titled for another six months. So yeah, by the time that property is finished, that could be two years easily. And Debbie, let me remind everyone here who's listening, you might have two, three months for titles, but then another one, two months delay, and then settlement, and then building approval council approval, which is another two, two, what, two months, I reckon, and then a call, logistics call to trades and, re- and delivery of, um, of raw materials for site. Delay, 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 delay here. And this is the reason why sometimes construction does take 12 to 14 months because of all these time delays. Don't get me wrong. Builders want to build as quickly as possible, right? And in in a perfect world, it should take four to six months to build a house. But too often we're seeing these delays because of lack of trades, lack of materials, 12 months out. And we're also seeing a lot more complications from councils, confusion over building codes and how they there's a mismatch with the SDA design guidelines, with with other building regulations. So that is also causing a lot of issues in certain parts of Australia too. So it just all comes down to the fact that there's so many different things that can be delayed. And by the time you end up with your finished house, it's it's been a long time since you looked at that data or we provided you with the data, and, and things have changed drastically. So how do we kind of mitigate this to any degree? Can we? When we look at our data, we look very closely at what is in the pipeline. We look very closely at what existing dwellings, SDA enrolled dwellings are there. If there's a lot of older dwellings and legacy homes we expect there's going to be, you know, a significant migration of tenants from those properties into new ones. And if there's not that much pipeline currently being reported, we could assume, and if also, if there is a, a decent projected increase of demand, the NDIS are stating, then all of those things can mean that there's a, still going to be a positive supply versus demand gap in two years' time, for example, to the best of our knowledge. But but really, a, a lot of this is all going to be guesswork. Unfortunately, there's really no other way around it. Um, if we could get better, more clearer, more timely data from the NDIS, which is what everyone has been asking for for, for several years now, it might help things. But at the moment, we're kind of stuck with what we've got. To answer your question, there'd be what can we do to mitigate this risk? I think if you go in, if you invest in an area where there's a massive undersupply of SDA stock. That's the first, um, I think, trigger there. Don't go into an area where there's equilibrium or slight oversupply because that means when you come out of the ground, you're 18 months down the track, you're, you're, you're in the oversupply phase of that area. So that's number one. Number two, that's, well, that's, that's common sense there. And if you guys are all looking at other areas and other products out there, please feel free to email us your query and we might be able to give you an answer with it on the spot. Because, you know, we do have a research team here of two, three people who are happily able to do a report for you for 400 bucks, done within two, three days, two days, to give you some peace of mind or comfort that, hey, that area you're looking at is okay or 
maybe a little red flag of um of oversupply already. Yeah, and look, it always does come down to even in, in areas that do have equilibrium or look like in in eighteen months' time it will have the the rule of desirability and design always still holds. So even if you're in an area that might look like it's already supplied, but you know it's still a good area, you want to build something there. Make sure you build the best possible property you can afford to build, fully future-proofed, um, really desirable, because you will at, at least still attract the tenants to your property over other ones that are more inferior design. Debbie, I reckon if we can you know, give it some layman's coding, layman's terms, it would be help investors. As an investor, you should not be jumping into an area or product just because someone, a friend, an agent, a spruker, said to you, oh, but it's 22% return, blah, blah, blah. You've got to get into it now. I think there's some common sense here. And I'll ask you some questions, uh, two quick questions here, Debbie. Common sense. When you're driving your car on the road, you see a green light. What do you do? I keep going. Yeah, because it's all good. It's safe. Go, go, go. If you see an amber yellow light, what, what are you thinking? Then? I'm thinking, have I got time to get through this safely or should I hit the brakes? Yep. Okay. And when you have a red light, you, you stop. Be. Cool. So if an, if an oversupply market is a red light in front of you, it's pretty clear what yep. you should be doing. If it's an equilibrium or just about to hit or is a little bit oversupplied right there or under, just, just under or a little bit over the equilibrium number, that's an amber, proceed with an caution, yeah. all right? If it's green light, I reckon, look, you know, there's medical facilities, there's population strong, there's no supply, there's the mark, good demand there, then it's green light, go for it. I mean, that's, I think that's how you should be thinking as an investor, not should I floor the pedal and get home one minute earlier, faster, because that's what people are doing right now. They're I'll just jump into it no matter what. And I, I'm not giving any I'm not giving any consideration to the risk here I'm just going to go into because I'm just I just I just want to get there quick as possible. And that's the worst decision you can do is jumping in, flooring it, and not considering the risks of jumping into a red red or an amber zone mm. comparison. Yeah. Good analogy, Min. Yeah. So overall, we'll finish off now with um, a reminder to everyone that there are a lot of potential delays that can affect your investment outcome. And we're seeing a lot of it in Debbie. A lot of people coming to us with empty houses now because they bought in the wrong area at the, at the wrong time. Buy the, buy the right product in the right area at the right time. I think we've got to really, really remind people that. People say, oh, you know, location, 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 amenities, amenities, amenities. But gee whiz, timing is also important. Buy the right product at the right location at the right time, which should be a good podcast topic down the track. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Any final words of advice, pearls of wisdom before we uh, hang up this podcast? Look, it's property investment, but it's not always about location, 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 as we would normally imagine it to be. There's so many other aspects. It's Yes, location is, is uber important. It's the three Ds, isn't it, Min? Design, desirability and data and really doing your research and asking why someone is, is selling your property in a specific area. You know, really do your own due diligence, particularly if it is going to be an area that or a build that may take some time to get to the market. Speed to market is is so important here for all of the reasons we've just been talking about. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. We'll hang up there and we'll look forward to our next podcast. I think um, it'll be good for us to um, do a podcast overseas where, just so you know, everyone we're heading off overseas to Vietnam next this week for eight days. It was supposed to be a meet and greet some of our new staff overseas in the Philippines in Vietnam, but for some reason, we now have 12, 11, 12 people coming along and mostly providers and developers who are participating in our SDA conference in over, overseas now. I, th- I think this will be the first SDA conference, I think, <laughs> overseas. International, but, yeah, but more about yeah, that later. Yeah, we'll do it next week while overseas. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.